Hey guys, thanks for having me. Most places online know me as Fraud or Sophos, um, or more recently as uh, Fidi Sophos, um, which is my new uh, motto. Um, a little bit about me, I got into the occult maybe eight years ago. Um, I've been a member of the OTO for about five years. Um, my local body is Gnarled Oak um, in the uh, Valley of Nashville, Tennessee. If you guys are ever nearby, let me know, and uh, maybe we can meet up for some coffee or something. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's mostly about me. Um, I don't have any real projects to share or anything, except uh, I am working on developing a few um, techniques on creating pinnacles, and uh, you'll see an example of my work in, in here. Um, and uh, hopefully someday I'll launch a store to uh, to sell some things like that. But um, for now, it's, it's just me uh, doing my own work. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and uh, also on the Q&A stuff, if you have any questions that um, you don't want to chat out in front of the um, audience, feel free to message me. Um, you can consider my DMs open. Um, so we'll go over just a little bit of the history. Um, I'm not going to deal a whole lot with the history of uh, Johann Trithemius, and you'll understand why in a moment. Uh, but uh, he was a German Benedictine abbot and polymath. He was uh, an expert on many things. Uh, maybe you've ever heard the term uh, Renaissance man. Uh, he very much is the definition of that. Um, most known for uh, cryptography and uh, occultism. Um, his most popular work in most circles would be... Um, oh, um, Steganogra uh, steganographia, um, which reading it on the surface, it comes across as a uh, magical text, um, but has since been deciphered and is uh, a book about crypt cryptography. Um, so that's pretty cool. But you do see um, historically people were using that as a magical text. I believe John Dee even references it. Um, so, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, he, you can Google his Trithemius cipher. Um, there's actually websites dedicated. You can create your own hidden messages with uh, with the ciphers that he used, which is pretty cool. Um, placing him firmly in the history of Western occultism, um, he taught to some degree uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Uh, Agrippa, if you don't know, uh, you certainly should. Um, writer of the three books of occult philosophy. Um, Excuse me. He um, is a linchpin in the, the history of the, the occult in, in the West. Um, how much he actually learned from Trithemius, we're not really sure. We know they probably met at least a couple of times. Um, and he advised uh, uh, Agrippa on um, some of the work that appeared in those books and also uh, advised some secrecy um, in a couple of spots, uh, from what I understand. Uh, he was also a teacher of Paracelsus. Um, from what I could gather just online, it doesn't seem like he was a direct teacher, but rather that uh, Paracelsus uh, got a lot of um, inspiration through his work. So um, you'll, you'll have people that will claim that uh, he was a direct, direct teacher of these people. I don't think he was for any length of time, uh, but they definitely drew from his work. Um, so really cool guy. Um, if you want some more history on Trithemius, um, Frauder Aker has a book called Black Abbot White Magic. Um, I have not read it yet. It's in my list, but um, it has a lot of the history of uh, Trithemius in it, as well as um, some other angel magic techniques. Um, I, As I said, I haven't read it, but uh, Frauder Aker's books have not disappointed me yet, so highly recommend that. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, the art of drawing spirits into crystals. Um, most likely not written by the historical Trithemius. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, academics referencing pseudo-Trithemius. Um, for us, as far as practitioners, um, that's something that we really should be used to. Um, you know, Solomon didn't write the, the Key of Solomon uh, or any of the Keys of Solomon. Um, we, we have books that are said to be written by Moses, uh, also probably not written by Moses. Um, this is probably 
um, a case of that. Um, f uh, a, a good uh, supporting piece of evidence, um, something I noticed, is uh, there's another book that uh, Trithemius definitely wrote uh, called Seven Secondary Causes uh, or uh, uh, Deceptum Secundes. Uh, cool little uh, book about uh, what angel is ruling uh, reality uh, 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 for the space of, uh, I think, 354 years and four months, very specific. Um, and in that book, uh, the angel of Saturn is uh, Orifiel, uh, whereas in the Art of Drawing Spirits and Crystal, we have the uh, the more typical uh, Cassiel. Um, so, you know, maybe he's just switching angels there for whatever reason. Um, I don't know. Uh, but it's most likely that he did not author this book. Um, that said, it is firmly uh, in the, the same tradition. Um, it's most likely based on um, Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy. There's various points that uh, seem to be pulled directly from that work. Um, so while you're going to find the Art of Drawing Spirits into Crystals, um, where it comes to us today is from uh, the Magus, written by Francis Barrett, um, which is in turn a ripoff of uh, Agrippa's three books. And sorry if you hear anything in the background, I have a, a four-year-old trying to yell at me from the other room, so I apologize. Um, uh, let's see. So, um, but really it, it's in that same tradition, three books of occult philosophy wasn't published until after Trithemius' death, so whether he wrote it or or whether someone else wrote it in his name. It's in that same uh, tradition. Um, I'm just going to be going over a lot of the basics today of uh, the art of drawing spirits into crystals. Um, if you really want to dig into the system as a whole, then it would involve a broader study of uh, Renaissance era magic. Um, and a great place to start would be uh, three uh, books of occult philosophy. Um, Eric Perdue has a uh, fairly recent, I think within the last year or two, tr uh, translation of the three books um, that is supposed to be fantastic. So um, that would be a good place to look. It's a little pricey. Uh, the Kindle version, I think, is a $99. Um, I did see a print version that was like 108 or something like that. So if, if you're going to get it, go ahead and get that. It's 800 something pages. Um, it's usually um, quite a bit more than that. So um, highly recommended. Um, it's going to be better than most translations you can find for free online. But if that's what you can do, get the free one online. That's that's good too. Um, so what the system is is really uh, it's a system of conjuring and scrying the angels. Um, a very simple, easy to work system. Um, if if you're keeping it bare bones, um, with a work like this, it's generally assumed that you have a history of uh, Renaissance era magic. So, Trithemius, pseudo Trithemius, isn't going to give us all of the instructions we need to do the complete work. Um, that said, if you just do what he says, uh, you're probably going to get some results. Um, if you dig further and and get some stuff from Agrippa's three books um, or from another source, uh, even adding on from um, um, the Greater Key, um, so. Trithemius here doesn't mention consecrating your tools. It's generally understood in Western magic that all of your tools, everything going in that circle with you is going to be consecrated. Uh, so things like that. Uh, he doesn't mention um, um, a time of purification, so he, he's not saying set aside three, seven, or nine days uh, to purify yourself, but that's part of the tradition as well. Um, that said, um, I'm going to tell you um, how I got success with uh, with the methods, um, and I didn't have that time of purification when, when we had our, our big, big moment of success, which I'll uh, tell you about here at the end of the presentation. Um, in fact, we messed up a whole lot, uh, but still got a good result. Um, a lot of it, I believe, depends on the, the user, um, the, the uh, conjurer and scryer, uh, where you're at uh, spiritually, physically, uh, mentally, um, how earnest you are, um, if you're doing the work to the best of your capabilities at that time. Um, there's a lot of devices and stuff in this that are very expensive to, to buy, um, even expensive or difficult to make. Um, 
they can be made, um, but uh, most people aren't going to want to do that, and that's okay. So we'll go through um, the uh, the tools, and um, I'll talk about uh, where I made substitutions before. Uh, I am in the process of building a, a full setup, um, which I, I'm very excited about, but I've got a good bit of work to go on that. Um, and it won't be a full traditional setup because I cannot afford uh, pure gold. Um, so that's just something I'm going to have to live without. Um, so yeah, for our, our list of tools here, um, just a, a brief overview real quick. Uh, so we have the crystal stand here um, made out of ebony, um, your crystal ball. And uh, that circle there is meant to be a gold plate um, that holds your crystal in. Uh, so we have the ebony wand um, with the uh, gilt letters, so gold letters, that's that's cheap enough to do. Silver candlesticks, um, uh, he says a tripod to burn incense, that's what that is over there. Not really a tripod, but um, uh, a laman, you're going to have one for each spirit that you're going to work with. Um, a ring, also not pictured, um, there's a picture of that later. And the circle uh, we see up there. Um, so we'll go through each of these in detail, and I'll talk about any substitutions we can make. Um, so um, the crystal stand, um, you see there on the right, there's a, a picture of uh, one that I found online. Um, I am partially through making my own. Um, not quite there yet. Um, if you follow uh, Ashin Chassan on Facebook, uh, you can see some excellent examples of ones that he's made. Uh, but yeah, they're made out of ebony or ivory. Ebony's more typical these days because uh, ivory um, is cruel. Um, if uh, don't don't make or buy an ivory one, please. Um, even with the ebony one, be careful about how that's sourced. Um, uh, but you can buy that. There's um, exotic wood websites you can buy ebony planks from. Uh, 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 based on a Catholic uh, monstrance uh, stand, so those are the these really ornate uh, stands that would hold, um, uh, it might be a, a saint's finger bone, or uh, they would hold the uh, uh, one of the hosts, the, uh, the uh, bread that is the body of Christ. Um, so kind of based on that, and if, if you look up a picture of a monstrance, uh, you'll immediately see the resemblance. Um, much smaller than you would expect. So we think of crystal balls today, and I think we kind of jump to like the the Romani woman at the table with her giant crystal ball glowing. Uh, this is quite small, actually, about this uh, one and a half inches across. Um, so about the size of a small orange is what Trithemia says. Um, held in place with a golden plate. Um, so one side's going to read Tetragrammaton. Um, and have those symbols that you see there. Um, that's the inside uh, that you're not going to be able to see. Um, and we're going to keep in mind those angels being used there, uh, too, um, on the outside uh, that you can see uh, Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Raphael. Um, so for these uh, angels of the Sun, Moon, Venus, and Mercury, um, fast forward quite a bit, and we get to the, like the Golden Dawn era, and we start seeing these angels accompanied with the uh, the elements. Um, I don't know that we see that this far back. I, I could absolutely be wrong, uh, but we do see these main um, astrological bodies um, showing their importance. These are the the ones that are going to be most involved in, in uh, the the creation and manifestation uh, of what we see. Um, if you're thinking about it in a Neoplatonic way, then uh, those are the, the spheres immediately above us. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, if, if there is an elemental uh, attribute working through here, um, it, it certainly wouldn't change the system a whole lot. And if you're more comfortable with those elemental attributes, um, it, I think it could only add to the system rather than break the system. Um, so feel free. So table of practice. Um, Mm, excuse me. Table of practice. This one is mine that I built recently. Still needs to be polished. It's the terrible picture. Once I, I actually get it polished up, it'll be nice and shiny. It's made out of brass. Um, uh, for those interested, I created this using uh, electrolytic etching. Um, so it's uh, 
water and this was just table salt, but you can use like cupric nitrate, some kind of metal salt, um, and run a current through it and that electricity is going to pull off anything that's not masked. So um, if there's ever any interest in that, I'd be happy to, uh, to walk somebody through that process. It's pretty cool. And since you're using salt water, um, what else do we know of salt water? Um, if you're interested in using holy water for this, you can certainly do so, uh, whether you're consecrating it yourself using um, like the greater key, or if you actually have connections to a priest, or just go pick up a bunch of holy water, um, that's an option for you. Uh, but um, the table of practice is not shown in the text itself. Um, so I, I've just put a description here, uh, and this is all you get. So this picture he here that I that I have is fairly typical of what you see today. Um, the angels and their characters uh, going around, and then inside of that, so you see here I have the four uh, kings, um, Aegean, Oriens, Epamon, and Paimon. Um, depending on what text you look at, some people use the um, the four elemental angels. Again, if you look at uh, Rufus Opus's book, uh, Seven Spheres, he uses the angels. Um, historically, that is incorrect. Um, that said, a lot of people get a lot of um, results from that. The reason I think the um, four, uh, I, don't, I hesitate to call them demon kings, but you'll see them referred to that as a lot, but they're also pictured as angels in places. But these four uh, kings of the corners of the earth are the... Um, sort of the gatekeepers. So when you have this, these gatekeepers on your table of practice, and then you have those four astrological uh, angels, um, again, uh, uh, Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Raphael, uh, you're creating this web of manifestation. Um, and um, I, th I think symbolically you're, you're giving a place for these um, angels or whatever else you're conjuring into this. Um, a way to manifest. Um, I, I've heard that described much more um, beautifully. Um, so as you do your research, you're going to find better descriptions than that. But um, I, I find the uh, the four kings to be an important part of this uh, system. Um, but uh, when you see it in the, in the text, it's uh, described as, uh, but on the table on which the crystal stands, the following names, characters, etc., must be drawn in order. First, the names of the seven planets and angels ruling them with their seals or characters. Uh, the names of the four kings of the four corners of the earth, let them be all written within a double circle with a triangle on a table. So this image is technically incorrect from what you see in the uh, in the text. It really sounds like there should be just two circles, two lines, and that all of these names should be in the middle of those. Uh, this looks a little better, and I think it um, makes a little more sense on a metaphysical level, and that's what you're going to see most of the time. Um, a note on the four kings that are being used. There are multiple names out there. Um, um, so uh, you see a lot of Aegean, Oriens, Maimon, Paimon. That's what I'm used to, but there's other names out there. Um, you're welcome to use the ones that uh, you're comfortable with your, in your practice or use the four angels. Um, that's your call. There's a lot of names out there for these entities. Um, next, we're going to see the wand um, made out of ebony. Uh, um, that ebony wood is going to hold a lot of the same value and virtue that um, you would see in the hazel wand in the uh, Greater Key of Solomon. Um, uh, it's going to be attributed to um, Mercury, uh, Hermes specifically. As you're holding these wands, um, it, it's hearkening back to the uh, the rod of, uh, of Hermes. Um, what's interesting about this one is that uh, the symbols and words on this are associated with a sword, which is very interesting because um, you're going to use this wand to trace your circle, whereas usually you would trace a circle with a dagger or a sword. So just an odd little note there. Um, I didn't even realize that until uh, recently looking through some uh, other people's notes. Um, but on one side, you're going to have uh, Agla, uh, own tetragrammaton. That Agla um, is, we're not actually clear on what it means, but what most people are going to tell you and what it probably means is a notarakon of uh, Ata Gibor Le Olam Adonai, uh, or Thou, O Lord, art mighty forever. 
um, own uh, um, a thelemites here. Um, that's going to be an important word for you. Um, you'll you'll understand that. But uh, historically, um, it means pillar or abode of the sun. Um, likely comes from a city. You can look up the biblical meaning of it. There's likely a, a if you see, I think there's a city in the Bible named Pillar. Um, that's that word being used there. It's uh, comes in from uh, Egyptian, I believe. Uh, could be wrong on that. Uh, and on the other side, it's going to say Ego Alpha et Omega, or I am Alpha and Omega. Um, so yeah, you, you want something about 18 inches or so. Um, I like, I, I have mine. Um, I do have a wand. Um, I don't have the gilt letters on it yet, but I've got it carved in. Um, and I've got it basically from my elbow to the tip of my fingers. Um, that seems to be a good size. Um, if you go smaller, that's okay. Um, if you can't do ebony, that's okay. You can paint something black to look ebony. You can use a hazel wand if that's what you have. Um, use whatever you have. Um, the more attributes you have to um, what it's going for, the better. Uh, but do the best you can with that. Um, I mean... If, if you have to go, you know, into your backyard and, and grab a stick or go to the store and buy a dowel rod with these words on there, um, you're going to be okay. Um, if you can, I would um, I would definitely suggest buying the, the ebony dowel. You can get one online. Um, if you really want to do it right, buy it on the day and hour of Mercury. And, um, yeah, so on, on Wednesday at sunrise would be the best time. Uh, purchase that and um, maybe the uh, ebony plank you would need to make your stand. Um, but that, that does get pricey, like I said. Uh, it does mention silver candlesticks. Um, just, again, candlesticks. Use what you have. I do have some silver-colored ones. They're not, not actually silver. Um, a little thing you can add in here if you're working with the sun and you want to use yellow candles, even better. That's just adding another layer of symbolism there. Uh, blue for Jupiter, or whatever system you follow, uh, use those colors. Or maybe if you're asking for, uh, you know, you can use green for Venus, but maybe you're you're asking for money or something like that, then maybe your, your candles are green for money. Um, it's not part of the system, and you're, you'd be adding something there, um, but I don't think you would be uh, in the wrong in doing so. Um, your incense burner, I just use a regular um, tiny little tabletop-sized uh, incense burner. I like to use charcoal and resin uh, incense, but sometimes I use a stick incense. Um, uh, the, the ritual, I'll tell you about at the end of this, I believe we were using stick incense. Um, so use what you have. Um, I do like this idea of having an incense burner that you can hold in your hand or place on the ground. Um, this does imply, too, that this work is done outside. Um, I think that'd be great if you can get away with it. Um, I live in a city, and there's no way I can get away with that without my neighbors um, thinking I'm completely uh, crazy. So I'm not going to do that, but you're certainly welcome to. Um, the incense burner is going to be placed between you, you and your circle and the uh, uh, table of practice where the stand is. Uh, the laman... Um, this is the example given in the text there. Uh, this is the Laman for um, uh, Michael the Archangel or Mikael. Um, you'll hang this about your neck um, over your breast. Ag again, if you're wanting to be truly correct uh, for Renaissance magic, you'll hang it about your neck using like a silver or gold chain or um, a virgin spun thread. Um, you know, just... Just hang. I, I I think I used butcher's twine on mine and uh, did okay. Um, the the writing says use virgin parchment or engraved on a square plate of silver. You can certainly do that. Uh, you can get virgin parchment these days. It's pretty pricey. Um, if you have paper, paper is going to work. Um, it's going to do just fine. Um, uh, the example. Uh, let's see. Can I solar sphere? Right. Um, so if you want examples of the others, um, Ashan Shassan's book has examples, as does Rufus Oaks's book. Um, I'll list those out later. Um, they'll have examples you can pull from for the designs for the other lamans. You can throw one together if you want. That uh, Hebrew up there that in the big letters um, is just the name of the archangel. Um, then you have the name in English there, and then you have the seal of the spirit. 
Um, you can put uh, the appropriate number of pentagrams there for for the spirit you're conjuring. So we have six there for the sun. Um, there's a lot you can do. You can design your own. Um, certainly an option. Um, you will have, like I said, you'll have a different one for each spirit. Um, you'll see also that the circle given uh, later on is, is also dedicated to Michael. And so the assumption there is that uh, these names are changed out for each spirit you're working with. Um, um, I think there's something to be said uh, about keeping Michael in just as uh, the de facto ruler of uh, the Archangels. But um, I've, ch I've changed out the symbols and, and that's worked for me. And that seems to be the consensus. Um, the ring. Uh, the ring is only mentioned once in the whole text when it just it tells you to put it on, <laughs> um, and that's it. Um, puts it you put it on the, your right hand on your pinky finger. I don't know if there's anything particularly important about it being your pinky finger or not, but that's what the text says to do. Um, this ring here is pictured, I, I think, on like the following page after drawing spirits into crystal um, is shown in the text from the Magus. Um, so you can use that design. Uh, if you are a fan of the Lamegaton, you can use that ring. Um, something there that's consecrated. Uh, traditionally, you're going to want it to be gold um, or silver. Um, a note on that, um, a lot of people, probably most of us, I know certainly I can't, um, I can't at this time afford a gold ring for, for my work. Um, I can't afford a brass ring, though. Uh, brass is goldish in color. Um, I think that's going to fulfill a lot of the same um, um, correspondences that we're looking for. Um, again, again, it's one of those things, do the best you can. Um, if you can afford to buy a gold ring, absolutely buy, buy one. You should. It'll help your, your work, I think. Uh, the more things you can be correct on, the better. Um, but don't feel like you... Um, and a, a note here. Um, perfe perfection is the enemy of the good when it comes to grimoire work especially, but any occult practice. Um, you can get everything perfect, but it's going to take you two or three years to gather all your supplies and get everything consecrated. Um, there is a bare minimum of, of things that you need um, to get started, um, and they don't have to be perfect. Um, so if if the best thing you can do is get a, a cheap, you know, buy, buy a cheap dowel or a stick to make your wand, uh, wrap a, I, I've seen people doing um, Enochian work where they use paper rings. Um, is that ideal? Uh, probably not, but um, but it's, it's better than nothing, probably. Um, and I think it's much more important to do the work and do it the best you can uh, rather than doing it perfectly, if that makes sense. Um, here we see the circle. Um, compared to a lot of other traditions, this is a very simple circle. Um, so we just see that the, the three god names there, Tetragrammaton, Elohim, and Adonai, uh, we got the the septagrams there, uh, hex, uh, hexagrams rather, um, and then up there in the corner we see um, again the seal of Michael, and we see this uh, symbol of the sun. Um, the general expectation um, is that you're going to trade those symbols out. So um, the one here in a few minutes that I'll be showing you uh, uh, the, the work that that I've done. Um, is uh, working with Gabriel, the Archangel of the Moon. And so for my circle, we used a little moon symbol and we used Gabriel's uh, name there. Um, a, a note on magic circles um, as a whole, this is not necessarily a protective circle. Um, there's certainly instances historically where we see a circle is meant to be some sort of barrier um, or bubble against whatever spiritual forces are outside. Um, I don't like to look at it that way. Um, this this circle especially feels almost more like a talisman um, than anything else. Um, you're you're creating a sacred ground uh, for your meeting to take place. You're certainly not protecting yourself 
from angelic forces. Um, in theory, they're not going to be the ones coming after you and trying to haunt you or anything like that. Uh, but even you can do this work, this same system to speak to demonic or whatever other entities. But even in those cases, um, my opinion, um, informed by um, other magicians that I have a lot of respect for, is that it's less about protection and more about setting up a common ground. So you're creating a circle here. Um, and you are, by putting these names in here, um, invoking a, uh, a deity for um, oversight. Um, and in the case of this system, the Judeo-Christian God um, is, in theory, watching over the work that you're performing in this circle. Uh, um, and who is going to misbehave in that? Um, So that, that's just my take, um, uh, but but certainly for the angelic work and stuff, you're not setting a, pro a protective circle here. You're setting up um, a hollowed ground. Uh, so you're going to put this circle on the ground. You're going to want it, in my opinion, you're going to want some type of physical circle, uh, whether that's carved in the dirt. Um, chalk is a great option if you have something you can draw on chalk. Um, if you want something that you don't have to draw every time, uh, you can buy a fairly cheap, just circular rug and flip it over and on the underside of it uh, draw a circle in Sharpie. Uh, leave out the angel name, the angel symbol and the uh, astrological symbol because you're going to put something else there each time you use it. Um, but put out all those other names on there and then you have a circle that's just done. Uh, you can do the same thing on canvas or whatever else. Um, so no reason to do it the same every time um, where you have to draw it. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm drawing a physical circle, um, it is going to be wonky and crooked. Um, so, which isn't the end of the world, but, it, you know, it, um, makes my eye twitch. Let's see. Liebert Spiritum. Um, this, uh, actually, I didn't have listed in the uh, notes earlier, but um, part of the way through the text, it brings up, um, the text just says, bring out your little book. And it calls it that, your little book. Um, so it's it's just your book that you're recording um, what you're doing here. Um, so you'll write down the name of the spirit, the character, office, and seal or image of the spirit. Uh, you'll want to do the ones that they give you. So you're talking to this entity and um, they should, so you'll, you know, you're conjuring Michael. Um, you'll get it to tell you its name show you its character, tell you its office, um, show you its seal. Um, and in theory, it should show you all of these things. Um, and that's what you should record. And you're, you're basically taking this time to interview the spirit, um, or as the Bible would call it, trying the spirit. Um, and you'll, you'll say, you know, all of this in the name of God. I, as you see there in that last note, I kind of subscribe to Jason Miller's idea that if you believe uh, that by telling a spirit not to lie to you in the name of God is going to make a spirit not lie to you in the name of God, um, maybe that works. I don't know. But if I was a spirit that that didn't work on, um, I would love to be in that position. Um, so if you're conjuring something, you know, ask some questions and make sure it, it is who you're trying to get, but um, one, if you're going to interview it in the name of God to make sure it is who it says it is, maybe you still don't believe it fully, or at least um, approach it with some skepticism still. Uh, but also, you, you know, um, I hopped on the server today, and um, a frog here came up, and we, we, you know, we talked a little bit and stuff. But he didn't ask who I was in the name of God because that's weird and a little rude. Um, so we're trying to talk to these spirits, and the first thing we want to do is is be a jerk to them when they show up. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, not my idea of how to function. It's very much the idea of how to function in this uh, Renaissance era spiritual practice. Um, so if you want to be fully traditional, you're definitely going to do this. Um, that just my two cents there. 
Um, Jason Miller's got some great ideas on that if you look at his blog. Uh, again, another author that I would highly recommend if you have not read his work. Um, also, he has some excellent courses. I, I'm currently in his um, Hecate 3 course. Um, highly recommended. Um, so, we did we go through this? Yeah, we talked about the stand. Okay, so we're actually zooming through this pretty good. So I, th I think we'll get to the Q&A pretty soon um, and do our break then. I don't know that we need another one, um, if, if everybody's good with that. Um, so the ritual itself, I'm going to pull up the text here on my screen. Um, you can um, go to esotericarchives.com. Um, it's an excellent resource. There are a ton of grimoires on there that you can just look at for free. Um, but not only that, because you can do that anywhere. You can go to sacredtext.com and, and get the same thing. Uh, but the benefit that you're going to get here is um, they're notated uh, uh, with notes from a scholar. Um, so highly recommend this site. Um, I can't recommend it enough. Um, if you want to buy a copy of this ritual, I would much, I would highly recommend you just copy what he has on the site, put it in your own book. Um, the ones I've found, for, for one, it's extremely short. Um, the ones I have found for sale, um, I won't name the author, um, but they're in little black books. You'll, you'll recognize them. Um, have ties to um, unsavory organizations, in my opinion. I won't go into all of that. Um, but uh, I would recommend you just print it off and, you know, you bind it yourself or you put it in a three ring binder or something um, or just write it out. It's, it's uh, easy. It's small. Um, um, I, I would recommend at least writing, writing the ritual parts because that's what you're going to need anyways. And uh, it just, it seems more occulty to uh, write out, you know, just a, on an aesthetic level to write it out in pen rather than, um, uh, printing or, or buying somebody else's uh, cheap copy. Uh, so for the ritual itself, you're, you want to observe the planet. It, I think the text just mentions the planetary hour. I would recommend the planetary hour and day if you can get it. If you um, can't do that, let's say you, you need to talk to the Archangel Michael and it's an emergency and you need his help immediately. Don't wait for Sunday. Um, just, you know, light a candle and do the work and, um, you know, see what's going to happen. Um, but if, if this is something that you're planning out, if you're kind of working through the spheres or something like that, then, uh, yeah, you want to look at the day and hour. Um, and if you're super hardcore about it, look at the elections. Cause if you're doing, um, if you're doing, um, Raphael, uh, Archangel of Mercury, um, you don't want to do it when Mercury's retrograde, probably. If it's an emergency, go ahead, uh, provide some offering or something like that to maybe mitigate some of that. But, um, you know, if you're planning this out in advance, maybe don't do it when uh, when Mercury's in retrograde or if uh, there's some other planetary force against it or something like that. But uh, on, on the base level, hour and day is fine. Um, if you look look up the, the text, um, Art of Drawing Spirits in a Crystal, um, there's actually a chart there that will tell you this spirit rules this day, this one this day, this one this day, this one rules this hour. And um, if you don't know about planetary hours, very easy. You go from sunrise to sunset, and, and you divide up the day by, this, by the planets. Uh, that's it. So when we say planetary hour, we're not talking about a specific hour. Uh, sometimes it is a little longer than an hour. Sometimes it's a little shorter. Um, so... Um, Back on Raphael, Wednesday is the day of, uh, of Raphael, a day of Mercury. Um, and the first hour of the day is going to be uh, the first uh, mercurial hour. There's other ones, but the first, the first hour of the day is um, historically the most uh, sacred. Um, so that's, that's, if you can swing it, that's when you really want to do your work. Uh, but there's also an afternoon hour in there you can, you can swing if you need to, or nighttime. Um, so th there's some leeway there. Um, the text itself recommends having a conjurer and a scryer. Um, actually, it just says have two present, um, and, and we take that to mean a conjurer and a scryer. 
but it just has two people there so if the spirit shows itself to one person and not the other um you didn't miss anything uh, most people tend to work with a with a conjurer and a scryer um that's what i've done i've worked as a conjurer i am pretty terrible at scrying myself but um i've had some success but not not necessarily with this system um so uh let me actually go to the text here so there is um an opening prayer um for success uh you see this in a lot of grimoires and, and the same thing here i'm not going to read the whole thing the prayer for success it's a whole paragraph uh you can find it um and do that but um you are um praying to to god to um open your eyes and to um bless the crystal um and consecrate it uh bless the land and stuff that uh, that you're doing it on basically a prayer for success um and strength and enlightenment um after this prayer you put on the ring um as i said this is the one spot that mentions the ring put that on your right pinky finger and you're going to put on the lamen or a pinnacle of the spirit. And you're going to take your wand and trace the ground, uh, trace your circle. Again, you're going to have a pre-made circle here, um, whether you draw it out in chalk or it's on the back of a rug or you use masking tape or a rope or whatever you use. Um, you'll do that and there's going to be a prayer associated with that as well. Um, you're going to light your incense. Um, again, that's going to be between your circle and the table of practice. And another note here uh, about this not being a protective circle, um, your incense is outside of your circle and you're not lighting it until your circle's complete. Um, if this were a protective circle, once you close it up, you're in there and you're done. Um, um, so just another note there. Uh, so you're gonna do that, you're gonna light your incense and um, uh, uh, you'll go through a consecration prayer of the fire and incense. Um, I'll go ahead and, and read this one. It's, it's pretty short. Um, so for, for the consecration of the circle, uh, you'll do, In the name of the Blessed Trinity, I consecrate this piece of ground for our defense, so that no evil spirit may have power to break these bounds prescribed here through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, and, you know, maybe you can say this is a protective circle and keeping evil spirits out only. Eh, um, I, it really feels more like a talisman to me, but that, that's my, um, my hot take of the day. One, one of many. Um, for the fire and incense, um, I really like this uh, consecratory prayer. Um, I conjure thee, O thou creature of fire. Um, so very animistic by him who created all things, both in heaven and earth, and in the sea, and in every other place, whatever, that forthwith thou cast away every phantasm from thee, that no hurt whatsoever shall be done in anything. Bless, O Lord, this creature of fire, and sanctify it, that it may be blessed, and that they may fill up the power and virtue of their odors, so that neither the enemy nor any false imagination may enter into them, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I like the really animistic uh, take on that. There's a, a creature of fire. Um, you'll do that. You, and then it says, bring out your little books. You're going to bring out your book to have it ready. Um, and through all this, too, you'll be uh, doing a consecration prayer on the uh, crystal. Um, that's I believe that's part of the, uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, so part of that opening prayer is uh, consecrating the crystal. You'll lay your hand on the crystal. Um, and another um, uh, animist prayer, kind of, oh, animate, inanimate creature of God, be sanctified and consecrated. Um, so, of course, as you can see as I'm reading this stuff, it is rooted squarely in the uh, Christian tradition. Um, so if we, I see this question pop up all the time, you know, can you do magic and be a Christian? Uh, you certainly can. Um, you can point them to this text, um, and they really shouldn't find anything super heretical. Um, that said, if you are not a Christian um, and you're working this text, I would I would still, at least at, at the beginning of your practice, stick with these names of God and, and bringing up Jesus and, and stuff like that. Um, 
that said, angels are older than Christianity. They're uh, older than Judaism. You can do some tweaking to a system um, to bring back its pagan roots. Um, uh, if, if you really want to get into that, start start looking at Jake Stratton Kent's work, um, Geosophia, um, amongst others. Um, and you can really dig into the pagan roots of all of this stuff. So I, I can you change out these god names for pagan gods? Sure, maybe. Experiment and find out. But um, you should know what the system is trying to do before you try to break it. So I would at least several times work through this and um, make it work first and then see if you can insert um, Odin or Hecate or, or someone like that. Um, and to add to that, I, I'll say I am not a Christian practitioner. Um, I was when I first started working on, on with this system, uh, but I'm not now. But um, uh, I, I, I would still personally, for this system, work through it with the uh, these god names, um, I think. Might change it up someday, but we'll see. Um, let's see. So yeah, you'll do the, at this point, you'll do the conjuration of the angel. Um, this is the part you want to make sure you start in the hour and day. So this other stuff you can do right before it. Um, and when the time comes, you'll do, in the name of the blessed and holy trinity, I do desire thee, thou strong, mighty angel, Mikael, or any other angel or spirit, that if it be the divine will of him who is called Tetragrammaton, etc., the holy God. So does that, etc., fill in the blank. Um, so Tetragrammaton, Elohim, uh, Adonai, you can do all of those names, um, or whatever else. Um, uh, the Holy God, the Father, that thou take upon thee some shape as best becometh thy celestial nature, and appear to us visibly here in this crystal, and answer our demands, and as far as we shall not transgress the bounds of the divine mercy and goodness, by requesting unlawful knowledge. Uh, but that thou wilt graciously show us what things are most profitable for us to know and do, to the glory and honor of his divine majesty, who liveth and reigneth, world without end. Amen. Um, and then it goes on with, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Uh, o Lord, by thy name we have called him. Suffer him to administer unto us, and that all things may work together for thy honor and glory, to whom with thee the Son and blessed Spirit be ascribed all might, majesty, and dominion. Amen. Um, so you'll do all that prayer for the Spirit to come, and you'll have an extra prayer to God there at the end. It's like, okay, God, we called him. Make sure you send him. Um, and if the Spirit doesn't show up right away, um, do the prayer again. Um, and if you aren't like some natural scryer, like I said, I'm I'm pretty pretty bad at visually scrying. Um, I can sometimes pick up on something. Uh, but there's different ways of scrying. So if you're doing this work by yourself and you're staring at the crystal and nothing's coming through, um, be on the lookout for other senses. Do you suddenly smell roses for no reason? Is there a tingling in the air? Um, for me, is there this uh, electrical static feeling in the air? Um, all good um, uh, ways to show that a spirit is near. Um, a little side note here, um, there was a time that uh, uh, my scryer and I were uh, working on a conjuration of uh, Michael, the Archangel of the Sun. Uh, we didn't get anything, and we, we kind of were considering it a bust. But throughout the entire time that we were conjuring this angel, his cat... Uh, was in the room and trying to leave the room and then trying to get back in the room and just freaking out. Um, and so we we eventually said, okay, nothing's going to happen here. And he asked me to banish. I, I usually at this point wouldn't banish it for something like that. But so I stop and then I do a banishing ritual. And at the immediately the end of the banishing ritual, his cat throws up. And it's the biggest pile of <laughs> cat puke that I've ever seen. Um, and is it a coincidence? You yeah, know, maybe, but um, everything was fine after that. Uh, so I would also add that, you know, maybe don't have your pets in the same room with you <laughs> while you're doing this. It can be uncomfortable for them. Um, 
uh, if you don't look at this stuff as, as real and only psychological, then you have to explain things like that. Um, for for me, it's a, a, a notch on the belt of these are real things that you're dealing with. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll do that. And um, eventually, hopefully, the spirit will appear. Um, and then you'll begin the interrogation process. Um, from my experience, as I said, I'm not a great scryer, so I, I didn't get any visuals or anything from this. Um, but I would ask a question, and uh, my scryer would receive an answer. And I, I actually had him uh, writing down the answer. Um, and uh, for the ritual that I'll describe at the end of this, um, uh, he was writing 100 miles an hour trying to get all this information down so faster than he would have been able to come up with stuff on his own. Um, but uh, through all of this, you're going to ask the spirit's name, its office, its sign or character. Um, you also want to um, ask when it's most agreeable to meet. Um, you're going through all this work, and you want to make this easier on you in the future. So you don't want to have to wait uh, for the proper hour and all that kind of stuff. If you can figure out a way to meet uh, another time uh, and easier, ask them what works. Um, and that's between you and the spirit that you're dealing with. Um, nobody else can give you that answer accurately. Um, and then, of course, in the text, you make it swear that it's not lying. Um, I'll, I'll read the questions as it puts it in here. Um, in the name of the holy and undefiled spirit, the Father, the begotten Son, and Holy Ghost, proceeding from both, what is thy true name? Um, isn't that just a lot? Like, um, if you're walking up to somebody on the street, would you do that? Um, so if, if spirits are real, I personally believe they are, then we can treat them like real things and just talk to them. But if you want to be traditional, then yes, go through all of this. Um, they'll say their name, hopefully. Um, they may not, but uh, hopefully they'll say the name. Uh, you'll ask their office. They'll do that. What is what is thine office? What is thy true sign or character? Um, what are the times most agreeable to meet? Um, and then, here let him swear, then write down his seal or character in thy book, and against it his office and times to be called through God's name. Also write, uh, write down uh, anything he may teach thee. So you, after all these questions, you can get a lesson or talk to the Spirit. Uh, but at the end of those questions, you're like, wilt thou swear by the blood and righteousness of our Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that thou art my, art truly Michael? Um, again, it just seems like a lot. And if, if the Spirit isn't actually bound by that, then you've just convinced yourself that a spirit can't lie to you that may or may not be able to and may or may not be willing to. Um, but again, if you want to be traditional, that's the way to go. Um, so again, my hot take, do with that what you will. Um, once you're done, you'll do, there's a fairly basic license to depart. Thou great and mighty spirit, and as much as thou camest in peace and in name of the ever-blessed and righteous trinity, so in this name thou mayest depart and return to us when we call thee in his name, to whom every knee doth bow down. Fare thee well, Michael. Peace be between us through our Lord, uh, uh, blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, then when the Spirit's gone, to God the Father, eternal Spirit, fountain of light, the Son, and Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And that's the end of the ritual, really. Um, uh, as I said, everything's very short. Um, so it, there's a few paragraphs describing the tools, a couple of paragraphs describing the process, and everything else you're kind of bringing to the table based on other things you've read and done. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, sorry, the last, last slide. License to depart, give praise to God. Um, so um, all of this is in the text. Uh, you don't have to improvise anything except any extra questions you want to ask the spirit or anything like that. And you can write those down in advance if you want to do that. Um, you can also change this text. If, if, the, if you're stumbling through these prayers, you can rewrite them. But you want to keep a lot of that same language, um, uh, the same names of God and things like that. But you can update it to be more modern. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. 
Uh, that said, there's something to be said about uh, using poetic language um, in your spiritual practice. Um, that's kind of why, you know, Wiccans do a lot of rhyming and um, we have people working in Latin and Greek and stuff instead of English um, or Enochian. Um, so, you know, that's something to be said. So um, uh, I'll give some excerpts from my meeting with uh, Archangel Gabriel. Um, so, as I say here, this is me and my scribe's experience. Um, yours may vary. Um, so don't base what you experience or, or what you hope to experience on what we say here. Um, because th this has been... We've had this dramatic experience, and we've had a bunch of other less dramatic experiences. So, um, and, and the same thing with with other occultists. If you're reading Crowley's experience of the Enochian um, spirits um, and expecting the same thing, you're probably going to be disappointed. But um, you know, read it to see what's possible, but then be open minded to what's going to happen for you. It's easy to get into that uh, space, the ritual space, and then start questioning uh, whether what you're experiencing is actually happening or not, or if it's all in your head. And I would argue that it doesn't matter. Um, just go through the experience. Now is not the time to question if it's real or not. Um, just go through the experience. And afterwards, even then, don't ask if it's real or not, because that doesn't matter. Ask if it's helpful or not. Does this improve your spiritual practice? Does it set you on a right path? Is it calling you a god or a king? If it is, it's probably safe to ignore that because you're probably not a god or a king. Um, but is it uh, pushing you in a good direction um, or in a helpful direction? You know, um, take that with you uh, rather than if what you're experiencing is actually true or not. So with that said, um, our actual experience. So I'll go through the tools we used here. Um, I listed all of these tools. Um, in in the transcript, um, along with astrological timing and, and all the information I could think of. It was a waxing moon, time, date. Um, the moon was trying with soul. Uh, we were facing west. I, we put all of that in there. So when you're recording this stuff, all the details you can get, the better. Um, we used a circle drawn with sidewalk chalk. Um, literally just children's sidewalk chalk. We had an ebony wand consecrated. The symbols and words were written with just gold marker. Um, had a black-handled dagger, which was unconsecrated. I used that to trace the circle, which was dumb because a dagger is not part of this system. <laughs> As I said, we did a lot of things wrong. Um, this was a very early experience for us. We had white candles, uh, a quartz crystal ball, a printed-off table of practice. We literally printed it on printer paper. Uh, we printed off Gabriel's Laman. Um, again, literally printed it off. We provided an offering of almond chocolate cookies. Um, your incense is also part of your offering, so if you don't offer anything else, um, that's perfectly fine. We offered this, and we got no response to the offering at all. Um, and you're gonna. Ha we had a lunar pinnacle for consecration. Um, I also had a, a um, profound experience with Ganesha shortly before this, um, so I um, did a short prayer and offering to Ganesha beforehand to remove boundaries. Whether that helped or not, I don't know, but um, that's in the notes here. Uh, we didn't do a full Solomonic bath or ritual purification, but we did wash our hands and feet with a, a hyssop uh, tea, basically. And we did the... the uh, um, Lamegaton style, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow uh, prayer. Uh, we read the lunar prayer uh, from the Hagromantia and we, we recited the, um, we had a pentacle of Mercury present as well and we recited the fourth versicle. Um, the fourth pentacle of Mercury is about having knowledge of all things. Um, and we did a invoking pentagram ritual. Again, if I were doing this today, I would not do that, but that's okay if you do. Um, and from that point on, outside of those things, we followed the text as written. Um, so uh, we questioned in the name of the Holy and an undefiled spirit, the Father, the begotten Son, and Holy Ghost proceeding from both, what is thy true name? And the spirit answers, 
Thou that makes the request both knows my true name, and yet the truth is veiled. Um, what kind of jerk response is that? Um, if a spirit does that to you, you should probably push for a better answer or a plainer answer. But I, I have learned that when dealing with angels especially, um, they are not close to us, and so they think in different terms. Um, so that may have been a perfectly valid answer for Gabriel. For me, it, it was not. He does confirm that he's Gabriel later on, um, but we should have pushed a little further there. And then I ask, what is thy office? Um, and a reminder, as I'm doing this, I'm standing behind the scryer asking these questions, and the scryer is looking in the crystal ball, and he is writing these things down. Um, in theory, you want to be in a situation where they are responding verbally, so you're getting these answers um, as they're writing them down. Down. So keep that in mind. Uh, what is thy office? Thine office is the veil itself, the shroud of night over the pleroma. This lie is the, of the utmost importance. It towers above man and beast so that one day man and beast shall tower over it. Um, I'm not giving you my notes on what I think all of this means. Um, if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share that with you later. Um, I'm just telling you what the angel said to us. What is thy true sign or character? I am both thine and the opposite. You know, what does that mean? Um, I am that which soothes you of your perils and that which causes your weariness. I am that which you reject, yet through me you will ascend. Um, so if you want to get to any of the other spheres, you go through the moon. You sowed. Um, and here, without us saying anything else, he says, I see that you aren't satisfied by the name. You have opened the door to the pyramid, and yet you, O oh foolish one, cannot see into the shadows. Um, so uh, we actually have this gentle ribbing that we're getting from the angel, and there's multiple points where it makes fun of us almost. Um, and we get to, uh, when are the times most agreeable to thy nature to hold conference with us? The times most pleasant to the jackal? Uh, which the jackal is a mercurial animal, sacred to Mercury, and dog, which is lunar. Do not take this lightly, or you will fall from the heights of Zion. Um, this is also the time of the frog. This will be understood in due time. And I do feel like we got a better understanding of that over time. Um, again, um, I can share some of that with you if you want. If you want to ask more specific questions later, I'll, I'm happy to answer. Um and uh, with, with, again, without us answer, asking any other questions, he says, Oh, squire, scryer, why do you weep inwardly? Uh, which my scryer was dealing with some shit at the time. Um, oh, conjurer, why are you unable to see me? Again, I am not a good scryer. Um, that is not something I brought up, but the angel was like, uh, why can't you see me? Am I not that which has guided you on this path away from the fires? Um, we say, Wilt thou swear by the blood and righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ that thou art truly Gabriel? And here he says, I am he, Gabriel, of which you speak. I have flourished in the gleam of the rays. I have plucked the passiflora from the soil and have gifted it to man uh, in their time of hunger. I am that which nourisheth through the time of hardship. Without me, how will your mind ever settle? How will the fruits of thought ever be watered? They will wither and rot, perish, and no longer spread their abundance. I come to you in colors more vibrant than you can fathom, adornments that make you uh, make the waves rush. Yet you cannot see them. O oh, child, you can see me in thee, but have not yet learned to see thee in me. How wild is that? Um, and so there we give the offering. Again, Gabriel did not respond to the offering at all, neither positive or negative. Um, Gabriel, angel of God, my request to you is threefold. Initiate us into thine sphere. Dissolve in our sight the illusions of those that would deceive us, whether on purpose or otherwise, and open our eyes with spiritual sight, as Elijah's eyes were opened to the army of yod heh vav -Heh. Um, so we're using some, like, biblical language there. Um, I think it's important, to, uh, as you're working with a spirit, to do as much research as you can, and it's good to sprinkle in little things like that. Um, because you're invoking um, their history. Uh, even if that history isn't true, you're invoking something and it's legendary. Um, still bring up those stories. I think that's uh, helpful. Um, and this is the final answer that he gave us, and probably the most interesting. Um, 
He says, O ye who thinks himself uninitiated, the path has begun. From your birth you have walked it. You must learn that the veil is the truth and that my symbol is the key. O ye who aspires to illuminate the pyramid, undo the lock with reverence and piety, through love and fealty. Then will this fear be known and the illusion shall guide you to the beauty of truth. O scryer, I am more than purple. I am the vibrance of the imagination. I am that which allows you to be awake. I am also that which causes men to sleep in their wake, never knowing uh, of their days to come whilst going through them. I am the brilliance of any autumn shower, the fluorescence of sorrow stirring the hearts of all. Through this sorrow we can come to love, and from this love we can come to, to uh, knowledge. Feel sorrow truly, both conjurer and scryer, and you will be the lavender under my wings. I leave you these final words. The sorrow of your soul will fill the fount of truth. And from there, we uh, we did the um, uh, license to depart. Um, I don't remember if we banished or not. I don't have it in my notes here. Uh, but yeah, that's my experience with um, the Archangel Gabriel. Uh, again, fairly short. Short. And uh, like I said, we made that's fairly early on in our magical career. Haven't had anything really that crazy before or since. Um, but it was very impactful. And it's one of those things that I go through and read every now and then. I feel like I always get something more from it. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. Um, so some recommended reading here. Um, Ashan Chassan's books, uh, Gateway Through Stone and Circle and Gateway Through Light and Shadow, uh, both excellent texts. Um, so uh, Stone and Circle is going to be your like basic introductory text. Um, if you are interested in the Trithemius work, but you want to be, if you want to go like full tilt and do it as accurately as possible um, and pull in um, all kinds of historical practice and things like that, Ashen Chasson's the way to go, and great Gateways Through Stone and Circle is, is a great resource. Uh, Gateway Through Light and Shadow is more of his um, experiences. It's a very big, thick book. Um, Rufus Opus, Seven Spheres, it's a little bit more of a modern take. Um, very instruction manual-esque. Um, it's going to be more of a basic practice, but um, it's effective, and you can do a lot of good work with it. Um, uh, his his main focus is uh, conjuring the angels and reciting the Orphic hymns as a way to introduce yourself to the spheres and have their influence correct themselves in your life. Because your your life is a is a um, uh, the philosophy that this comes from um, is real quick. Sorry, is that your soul descended through these spheres uh, to incarnate on this world. And as it goes through these spheres, it's gathering the positives and negatives of each one. And so Rufus Opus's work here um, deals with correcting the bad in your life through this work. Um, it's very easy, and um, you can actually find it legally free in a lot of sources online. Um, I would encourage you to buy the book Seven Spheres. Um, but even if you go online and ask Rufus Opus himself, he will probably point you to a free spot to do it. Um, he also has the modern Goetic Grimoire, which is dealing with uh, Goetia uh, using the same scrying method. I have not read this book, um, but I would, uh, um, I've heard good things about it. So again, this, this uh, technique doesn't just have to be used on angels. You can talk to demons, you can talk to elementals. Um, I hate using the terms angel and demons because it's a lot more fluid than that but um in basic terms you can deal with a lot of different types of spirits using this technology um again agrippa's three books of occult philosophy uh that eric purdue translation um is going to be your best translation there um digital digitalambler.com this is sam block's uh blog also known as polyphonies online um this guy is a modern cornerstone of occult knowledge. I would highly recommend you visit his website and just look all over it. Um, his work on geomancy alone is mind-blowing. But um, he has multiple sections dealing with drawing spirits in the crystal. Um, I would highly recommend it. Also, theomagica.com. Um, this is Frater Oak Acres' um, website, one of his websites. And it deals with this same process. The, these are 
both excellent websites to go to to get more insight from magicians and how they're working similarly and differently from each other within this same tradition. Um, and that's all I really have for you for now. Um, so, um, yeah, Frog, if you want to uh, set us up for a break, um, and then we can come back for any questions somebody might have. For the Q&A, we have our wonderful microphone over there. So I would like to ask people to line up behind the microphone if they have any questions or comments. Uh, hi. Yeah, uh, I have some experience with uh, scrying, uh, but I've only ever done it with my eyes closed. Now, if you're using a uh, scrying ball or a scrying mirror, is the spirit actually seen literally within the uh, scrying mirror? or ball or is the uh, is the stone more of an aid or a tool to help you see the spirit within your own mind uh sure good question um I, again i'm i'm pretty bad at scrying so uh, i'm probably not the best person to answer um most of the experiences i've had that have been good uh, with scrying have been eyes closed um or even eyes open, but still like in my head. Um, I've I've heard both uh, from other people. Um, I've heard of uh, I want to say Ashin Shasan has like seen images in the crystal and then looked away and looked back and the image was still there. Um, and I think for other people it, it can be a focal point. Um, but again, I, I don't know that I'm a good enough scryer to really answer your question with any degree of certainty. Uh, that's great. Uh, thanks very much. So my question for everybody uh, here who presents their um, their practice and interest is how um, suitable is this practice for people you know who aren't completely invested in ceremonial magic? Could they make it work for themselves? Yeah, sure. Um... I think if you're if you're wanting someone to do it correctly and accurately, um, I'd say no. But um, if you're if you're taking it as just as the text is and uh, approaching it from that angle, I, I I think it can be very forgiving. Um, and I don't think you have to be an expert at anything. Um, I yeah, and and even tool wise, um, I, I as I said in my example there, we printed out the table of practice and we just had a crystal ball on the on the top of that, um, and a printed out lamen that we hung up with uh, butcher's twine, um, and we even had tools we weren't supposed to have, and some of them were consecrated and some of them weren't. Um, it was a hot mess, um, and we still got the results that I described to you. Um, so I yeah absolutely I think it's a good entry point especially and if you're looking for a good entry point Seven Spheres by Rufus Opus um, is probably about as user friendly as you as you could get. Right, the thing about you know Tritemius or pseudo Tritemius that sounds like a huge deal to me. It's news to me as well. Um, would you say it is important or maybe? the only way to speak accurately to, to speak of pseudo tritamius and not you know actual tritamius when we're talking about this work should people do that what do you think uh probably not i mean for for the usual practitioner or person on the street like they don't care um you know if if you're dealing with it on an academic level which probably none of us are i'm certainly not um, it's a distinction that's not terribly important. We just want to know if the magic works or not. Um, you know, so yeah, if, if you're dealing with it historically, then sure, it's probably worth mentioning, which is why I brought it up. But um, outside of that, I don't, I don't see it as a big, big issue. Yeah, fair. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if somebody would like to practice this system, well, you mentioned it might be useful to spend time uh, digesting Agrippa or in general looking at Renaissance magic and, and, and things from that time. Um, but is there like a path that you could suggest, like if you're at zero and you want to get to doing this practice uh, best you can, which books or practices should one do along the way to get there? Is there any suggestions you can make there? 
Um, sure. Um, I mean, really, you can go to esotericarchives.com, go to the, the section for this ritual, and work straight from that and be good to go um, and get surprisingly good results. Uh, that said, meditation is always going to help. Um, um, yeah, uh, especially uh, mindfulness is going to... Being aware of what your body feels like and what your mind feels like um, versus what it feels like when something else is present, um, I think is important to the work. Um, so yeah, meditation can definitely help. Um, uh, doing a, a regular daily practice of some sort, whether that's the uh, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram or invoking ritual of the pentagram or both. Uh, or something similar, or um, even just a planetary prayer every day. Um, something like that, I think, can really boost um, what you're doing, especially with these planetary workings. Um, so that, that would be a good thing to start, and it's super easy, like, on the appropriate day, and hopefully in the appropriate hour, do the planetary prayer. You can find those in the Hagramantia. Uh, you could also do an Orphic Hymn, um, if you're more comfortable with that. Um, so I, I think that's a lot of what I was doing there early on. Um, but yeah, you, even if you're you're just figuring this stuff out and you you find drawing spirits into crystals online um, and you go out to the dollar store and figure out the closest thing to the tools that you can afford for $10, I think you'd get shockingly good results. There, there's a story, I believe, of Rufus Opus um, uh, conjuring Gabriel in a uh, cup of coffee. I, I could be remembering that wrong, so I, I don't want to like make him look good or bad or whatever, but um, that's a possibility. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it, it's a user friendly system, uh, not, not probably not as user friendly as like the um, oh the Armadale, which is literally just pl praying to the planetary spirits and having them show up uh, or planetary intelligences rather. But uh, but still, it, it's so simple. I think you can really just kind of get into it. Yeah, that's actually really cool. Um, I guess especially in, in the context of my next next question, you know, of the accessibility. Because uh, I said this at the start, I'm not sure how it, true it is in your experience, but I think I can count on one hand uh, the people I've talked to in a decade or so who practiced this, um, and you're one of them. So. Yeah, what's your experience? Do people practice this a lot today, um, uh, or, or or not at all? What do you think? In certain circles, a lot of people talk about it a lot, <laughs> um, but you know, there, there's a big difference between people talking and people practicing. Um, so, of really, after Rufus Opus and his book came out. Um, I know there were a lot of people working in his particular version of the system. Um, another big practitioner that I believe works in this method is um, Alison Tchaikovsky. Um, she sells pinnacles and stuff online, and she's using this process to, uh, I believe, conjure the angel so that the angel can directly uh, uh, consecrate the items. Um, again, don't quote me on that, uh, but uh, I, do, I do know that she works this process. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's seen a jump in popularity, partially because of its uh, apparent simplicity. Um, I think uh, some people are missing some of the things that could really make their practice take off by digging into the uh, Agrippa's work and other uh, magicians from around that time and, and seeing how everything fits together like a puzzle, because th this, this is just some loose notes, really. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think it, to get back to your question, I think it has taken off the the last few years. Um, um, I I do think here the last year or so, I've seen more talk about more uh, chthonic work than angel work. But um, but I know a couple of years ago, I was hearing a lot about it. Mm, that's interesting. So it's even evolving different directions. Um, so that's definitely maybe a testament to. Know, the relevance that, that it's always had or, or maybe is getting again. That's really cool. You've kind of explained all of the um, interesting details about the tools themselves. 
a lot of the elements you see it's very much but consistent with the time and, and, and other things um, but it does seem like there's also a little something exotic about it uh, is that just my perception or is there anything you can say about that yeah i don't know of another system that's using anything similar to a monstrance um a table of practice is is pretty common um i let's see yeah this the stand really stands out uh uh and the wand you don't see a lot of ebony wands brought up in a lot of the grimoires they, they tend to stick to um hazel or um or like an almond wand that you see with um with the uh hga work um but uh i don't know i've i kind of started early with this system so ebony wand is kind of uh what i like now um uh side note if you're if you work with ebony wear a mask it'll really mess your lungs up um it's a it's a very fine grain and tough wood to deal with uh so wear a mask um but uh, yeah i i think those things really st make it stand out um, it, it's also a barrier for entry because people think they, again, they have to get it perfect. Um, and so they want to, um, you know, it, even if you're making it yourself and not using actual gold, you're still going to spend a couple hundred dollars just to get everything together. Uh, not counting the tools you're, you're using to, to shape it. Um, so even that's expensive, but... But again, yeah, there, there's other ways around it. You can make a table of practice out of anything or uh, you know, print it off, off on a piece of paper, uh, put your crystal ball right on that. I've seen one person, they wanted that gold band around it, but they couldn't afford everything else, so they just made a brass band circlet kind of thing and set it on top of the crystal. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of options out there. Would it be allowed to bring a tape recorder into the setting? Somebody recently mentioned using this for all sorts of magical stuff from, like, diaries and um, uh, taking notes during operations and so on it kind of blew my mind you know such a simple piece of technology that we've <laughs> had for so long uh, how do you feel about putting one um, you know in vicinity of this operation um, and if you agree with it where would you put it um, I think it's certainly worth experimenting with it's not something I've done it I think it's definitely worth experimenting with as to where I would put it um, I would try different places, you know, put it in the circle, put it outside of the circle, put it next to the stand. Um, just, you know, see what different results you get. I will add that um, I've heard Dr. Stephen Skinner on a podcast um, talk about how dumb it is to use a recorder and that if you really get a spirit, it's going to mess it up. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I think it's worth giving it a shot. No, not really. I mean, worst case scenario, um, it doesn't work, and sometimes rituals just don't work anyways. I, pro I probably wouldn't use your phone. Because, um, yeah, you know, there's so much other, so much else going on with your phone. Um, but, but you could. I, I will say, sorry, uh, it, using any kind of tool like that, technically anything that you're using in the ritual, even a tape recorder, um should be consecrated so uh it might it might be worth getting one specific to the work and just using it every time yeah you kind of did suggest that it might be better to do with two people and you also suggested that it is possible to do this work alone um, but is there anything else um, you would like to share on that topic specifically the pros or cons of uh, either uh, sure. I, I've mostly done it with a partner, um, and that I've, I've gotten good results from that. Um, I, it, it's been... One, if you have a partner and you schedule a working, you're definitely going to go through with the working, right? If it's just you, it's so easy to get to a point where it's like, well, I'm tired, maybe I'll do it next week. Um... And so there's that little extra bit of accountability, which is great. Um, then, uh, but also, you know, doing it solo, you're doing something, pers you know, sometimes this stuff gets really personal. Um, you're, you're dealing with inter internal aspects of yourself. So it can be helpful to do it by yourself too, I believe. But um, you can get some of those same, same 
personal results from just dealing with the work. So, like we we saw in, in the ritual that I shared, the angel calling me out on some bullshit. So, um, you know, um, that can that can be a thing. Yeah, just curious, is your experience of the angels, you know, getting them this way, um, similar or different in any way um, to, you know, other systems of the time that are offering methods to, uh, um, you know, contact certain angels, say, um, you know, as the Mikhail, you get through this system, the same one as you get through um, contemporary other systems, yes or no, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't have enough experience with other s angelic systems to give you a firm answer on that. Um, I, I, I do wonder if, um, like, your Michael and my Michael are, are exactly the same, or if they're just bits of, the, of a bigger one. There, there's something to be said about the idea of, um, in my opinion, spirits are very fluid. Um, we were talking about this on the Discord server a little bit yesterday, I think, um, where I, I think there's like a, a Venn diagram and that everything in this part of the Venn diagram is Michael, even even if uh, it's a small circle within that or something. And maybe we're just getting part, parts of that Venn diagram instead of the whole thing. Um so, you know, uh, I'm not sure. That's that's just my, like, kind of personal take on it. Uh, but, yeah, I don't have enough experience with, like, Enochian or, or um, Armadale or anything like that, that to give you a really informed opinion. Um, well, that's it for my questions. I guess we'll real quickly go to one or two questions from the YouTube viewers. Oh, and also uh, compliments from the viewers, uh, Frater Sofas. They really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, one person asked if you are part of a magical order. And again, if that's private, um, you know, feel free to let us know. No, that's okay. I'm a I'm an OTO member. Um, uh, have been for five years actually. Actually, probably f I think five years coming up this November, um, which has been a good experience for me on the local level. Um, so if I, I will say, um, as far as lodge magic goes, it's not quite my vibe, but, um, I've enjoyed being part of that group and, um, learning and growing with them. Um, again, I, I'm actually part of, uh, Gnarled Oak, um, Oasis out of, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. And the way we got to know each other kind of through the yield grimoires discord um that sort of implies that you are also pretty heavy on you know the self-study self-initiation yeah my my early you know most people come into magic and they're doing something simple and and i saw the grimoires and immediately jumped into <laughs> doing that which you should not do you should start with something else <laughs> um but uh yeah um grimoire magic was always my thing um specifically Solomonic Grimoire Magic, which I've kind of grown out of in a sense where I've become more interested in Chthonic stuff through uh, via um, uh, Jake Stratton Kent's work um, in trying to repaganize uh, Christian, the repaganize the uh, Grimoire experience that uh, existed long before uh, the judeo-christian setup that we have now thanks uh, uh, for being here uh, answering the questions and giving the wonderful presentation that's it for the questions yeah is there anything you want to say or ask the audience uh, for your uh no but um you guys are welcome to um on discord if you want to dm me any other questions or anything i'm happy to answer whatever um yeah just uh let me know okay i think that concludes today's um session then i want to thank you again very much uh, for soaps it was really an awesome uh, time 
Um, of course, it's very easy to get uh, in here for anybody watching on YouTube still. Um, you only need a Windows computer and you can join us in the room. You don't have to sit, uh, just view through the browser. Um, yeah, that's it.